this is our second uh, post-COP DigiCOP that uh, webinar uh, and we wanted to give you a, a little reminder of what we did last time first of all and then we'll hear like last time a series of provocations there'll be four provocations this time first we'll hear from Anne with an overview of the climate education pledges that emerged from COP26 then Anna Romero Betsy King and Will uh, from a variety of perspectives sharing climate education pledges um, and policy and practice and then we'll be going into breakout groups to connect and share a little bit about our own thoughts on pledges and what we might prioritize what feels most important and then a space for us to share what our own pledges might be what might we be able to commit to our own selves and within our organizations and then next steps what's coming up after that so first of all a little on the what we did last time thanks Anne if you weren't able to join us, then there are some fantastic resources, video recordings that Ellis has kindly edited together, which capture the three valuable provocations that were submitted by Professor Alison Phipps and Hazel Naginda and Lydia Merrill. Um, they were talking to us about their COP26 experiences and the YouTube links are here and will be circulated and have been circulated. We now have a lovely YouTube channel that are hosting all of these. Um, Hazel talked about her uh, example of pupils in Uganda growing up with climate emergency as their as their lived experience and talking from Worcester here as I am um, I that really resonated with me because uh, last year in 2020 parts of our city were underwater for three months and that lived experience children growing up with climate emergency being something that's real and affecting their lives whilst they might not explicitly be thinking of it as climate emergency the flooding that they're having to contend with and move their lives around and park their cars in different places their parents and take different routes to school was very much a lived experience for the pupils here in in Worcester too so uh, we'll be hearing about those four provocations and we'll go straight ahead into Anne Finlayson talking to us about the overview of the COP26 pledges that emerged thank you Anne sorry I went it went earlier than I thought never mind um so I don't know if many of you have been able to watch the November the 5th um, date at COP26. It was a whole day. Uh, and for the first time ever, it was an education day. Um, and not only was that unique, but what else was unique was that what they did was um, encourage both environment and education ministers to make a joint pledge or pledges. And that is a bit unheard of, but I can hear that young people would be very keen on that because that shows some uh, connecting up in systems that we need to do. Um, it was co-hosted and designed by both the UK government and the Italian government and UNESCO. And they had uh, some things that they were definitely pushing. And one of those was youth um, engagement, um, but it was also designed alongside uh, and hosted by MOC, the MOC COP, I find that hard to say, mm -hmm. and Youth for Climate. Uh, who both uh, both their representatives spoke really well. Um, and what was said, the UK was just briefly, but we'll be doing more about this next time. Uh, UK was talking about net zero school estate. Uh, they were talking about climate change education and they were talking about engagement with youth. Italy, um, they were wanting to make this Youth for Climate event, which is what this event was and the one before um, in Milan. They wanted to make that an annual um, UN event um, but it has to be done by the Italian education minister kept going on about it all being done in a peaceful way. If you want to read more about what UNESCO wants, they've got an ESD roadmap toolkit for 2030 on their road uh, on their website. Um, and then Phoebe Hansen from, sorry, I don't know how that happened. Phoebe Hansen from Mock um, COP uh, talked about the six areas uh, that they were interested in. And um a bit disappointed that there weren't more countries in the room uh, or more pledges, but she talked about integrated approaches, systems approaches, investing in teachers, climate change education with young people, not with and not for them. And I love this bit, every student, every job, every subject. And then Sahil Rashid Baid uh, spoke for um, Youth for Climate. Um, sorry, it's uh, doing different things. Um, I think something's overriding me. Okay. Um, 
So what I'd like to look now at is uh, some of the countries that sent video clips in, Finland, Sri Lanka, Andorra, Cameroon, Spain, Nicaragua and Greece. And, and I basically want to say that there was a, you know, there was a combination of people who were saying they're going to do a strategy. Spain talked about a strategy. Greece talked about their current strategy and lessons learned. There are quite a few um, countries talking about what they currently do and seem to be quite happy. Finland um, are very much, they've, they've been leaders in this for some time, very much um, wanting to um, engage with young people in a better way. So apologies by YP, that means young people. Um, Nicaragua, very much talking about coexistence and conservation. Um, Cameroon talked about developing action competencies. I was, I was thrilled to read that, hear that. There were other countries, Scotland, but Betsy King's going to talk about them later, so I'm not going to uh, do much on that. Malawi were very keen on adolescent girls and STEM and a, and a digital approach, so they were starting to look at the intersectionality of all this. I'm, that's a new word I keep using. Uh, Colombia have set up this national school for environmental ed called SABIA, uh, but they talked about passing legislation to update and resignify basically the purpose of education for all levels um, and in all parts of society, but they talked about human rights, they talked about gender, they talked about intergenerational approaches. Um, and Japan uh, talked a bit about youth um, and um, they're hoping to have a joint meeting with agencies and ministries. I mean, I'm just surprised that hasn't happened yet. Uh, they talked about their UNRCEs, which I know Scotland is one of, um, and the ESD decade, but uh, there wasn't much new coming from them. So my comment is, there were some pledges, there was some reviewing of practice or feelings that they've already done well and just need to look at what else they can do. And there were some people who were redefining the purposes of education. They had some very different understandings of youth engagement. Um, so some people just had four young people stood there. Others, you know, definitely the young people had actually contributed to something. Uh, and there were quite a lot of strategy um, pledges rather than actual actions on the ground. So um, for me, that was a little bit disappointing. So what's your view of those pledges? There were apparently 21 all in all, those are not 21 there, but um, you can certainly watch the video again. Um, but, you know, just off the top of your head, what are your views of those sorts of pledges? And what we're asking you to do is just record them on chat, please. What I'd love to do now um, is introduce you to Anna Romero. Um, I don't know, Anna, if you've got a slide or if you're just going to talk. Anna was at um, um, COP26. She was a Mexico delegate in the blue zone for the whole two weeks. Um, she's um, a seed trustee, uh, but she's also part. Of, so what she's involved in with the Mexican delegation is this Action for Climate Empowerment or ACE. Um, and capacity building for COP26. It's been an ongoing process. Uh, and she's part of all sorts of other things here in the UK. Um, so, sorry, I don't know what's happening here. So over to you, Anna. Let's, I'd love to hear your views on um, COP26 and the pledges. Well, thank you very much for having me and for the invitation and sharing this experience. I don't have slides. I will just talk and, and I really like the interaction with everyone. So please feel free to make any questions if you have them. Uh, as, Anna, as Anna has explained, I have been in the process of following the negotiations since 2008. Uh, but these for the last two years, I have been following, in, following them in the capacity of being a negotiator for the Mexican government, which uh, has placed me in a different perspective and understanding much more about the process, how it's going internally. Um, before, I used to belong to different constituencies, uh, and I was following the negotiations from the younger perspective, that it was the youth group that follows and observes the negotiations. Then I was in the NGO, uh, that is related on NGOs related to all the organizations that follow the process, the RINGO, that has to do with the researchers and universities, and then 
the last one was related to local governments. So I have been having a taste of different phases uh, that we have been going through the negotiations. And unfortunately, I must say very openly that the process is, is going, but it's going quite slow for the climate emergency that we are experiencing. Uh, and, and the dialogue that is uh, taking place is advancing but again, it's advancing in a quite slow phase. Uh, my experience in this negotiation 26 um, uh, related to action for climate empowerment, uh, if I may describe it a little bit in case for people that don't identify this track of negotiation. So we have um, 17 tracks of negotiation and two of them, one is action for climate empowerment and the other one is capacity building. So ACE, as is known, is a term adopted by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change to the no work under the Article 6 of the convention that was adopted in 1992 and the Article 12 of the Paris Agreement. Uh, so the main purpose of ACE is to establish the basis to empower citizens around the world to engage on climate action in an informed way through six elements, education, Train, training, public awareness, public participation, public access to information and international co cooperation on climate change. So all these six elements are pillars for ACE to really function and to really uh, empower citizens through their countries to really establish that connection and that uh, action, climate action that is necessary. So in that sense, ACE becomes a central element to tackle climate change. It's the social phase of climate change, let's say, uh, by providing the global society with the right elements to tackle this big problem. And in, in an informed way, achieve a low mission or resilient and sustainable lifestyles and behavior of societies towards climate change. Um, so uh, there was lots of discussion around certain topics that were essential for ACE to continue working. Uh, so those are the principles related to justice that are related to gender, intergenerational equality, interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral uh, perspective of multi-stakeholders and participatory approach in a systemic approach. So during COP26, ACE was very known uh, as, a, well, is defined now as the Glasgow Work Program and will be adopted for the next 10 years. So because of the importance of the length of time that it will be active, it was extremely important to let these six elements very clear as pathways for countries to work on. Education has been very well established. As Anne has mentioned, there, were, there was a day dedicated to education and these pledges were established as a goodwill of countries to work on them. Uh, However, there were different challenges. Uh, when we work through the documents that are precisely guiding the steps of countries, uh, you always enter in a negotiation process in which there are countries that may not like different topics related, for example, of uh, transparency, uh, public participation, gender, uh, generational equity so there are countries as well that they are like oh i don't really like oh. things <laughs> so unfortunately we went through that process uh and um ace was very weak and is very weak in this glasgow process related to human rights and human rights is an umbrella for all these topics um, so the next uh, phase of this process of negotiation is going to be in uh, June in Germany, in Bonn, uh, where the intersessionals of the SBI group, where ACE belongs to, is, is a whole process, how it's defined. Uh, but there is going to be a new phase of negotiating precisely that human rights is established as a central point for ACE. Uh, so... Um, during COP26, uh, ACE uh, was expected to strengthen the previous work done during the previous year, uh, but different need, the points need to be discussed now by the parties related, for example, the integration of ACE into national reports, because that's transparency and access of information for citizens. So. I, in my perspective as a negotiator, all these pledges are, are sounding 
marvelous and it's very nice that the goodwill of governments is there, but it needs to be regulated and really pre pre present in the uh, national policies of each country for them to be mandatory. Uh, so um, another part that it was very important uh, for these to work properly is the strength of national focal points by increasing their interactions with national stakeholders and through the establishment of robust networks for international communication and collaboration, which uh, this allows to promote in implementation of climate education. I don't know why you asked that. Sorry, someone's not switched their um their then have uh, muted. Not to worry. Sorry. If you could all mute, please, apart from uh, Anna. Did you hear that? <laughs> Uh, so promoting the implementation of climate education, training, public awareness, participation and access to information. So the integration of the Article 6 in the selected policy areas such as adaptation and energy transitions, for example, becomes essential uh, for all these pillars, as I have said, to be like um, guidelines within the policy making. So cementing uh, public support for decisive climate action through national policies that enhance expert and local knowledge and increase public awareness of the challenges posed by the climate, uh, by, by climate change and the solutions is so well. Um, so Anna, I will say, that... sorry. 30 seconds, Anna. Okay work program, in few words, needs concrete activities and guidance uh, to ensure effective implementation of Article 6, which is not reflected yet, unfortunately, to these pledges. Uh, capacity building is a bit more easy and is the uh, a platform that identifies and implements uh, different adaptation and mitigation actions, but as well, uh, relevant aspects of education, training and public awareness are set there. A big issue is finance. How do we finance all these processes uh, with the money that is given now in this uh, um, international agreement that is, in, is not sufficient at the moment? And how is everything assigned? So my big question for you is, uh, how do we really make countries uh, responsible for all these pledges, but that they become a reality in the political life to really implement all these actions and, and goodwill. <laughs> Thank that's, you. That's great, Anna. There was, there's so much in there. I'm going to be, we, we are recording and I will be watching that again to try and understand that all. I mean, yeah. I think two things I've taken away. It's very complicated and it's been going on since 1992 <laughs> and education needs to link up to ACE and all of these other um, processes that could really embed this across uh, as a right a human right across all of societies. Is that about right? Yep. Absolutely. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Ellie. Thank you so much, Anna. Really good to connect us with, yes, as you say, the marvellous work that is happening, uh, but also that there's a, something of a lack of that sense of urgency, perhaps in moving this forwards and that accountability question at the end, how do we actually, uh, great question for us to think on. Thank you so much, all those that have posted in the chat for Anna to have a look at, bit of appreciation of Columbia's uh, approach here with their pledge. Thank you very much. And uh, a few other documents for us to link to. So thank you so much for using this space to share all your ideas. Um, I'm going to introduce now the marvellous Betsy King. Uh, I can see that you're already uh, highlighted, uh, sort of spotlighted. Um, and Betsy King, I'm sure most of you know who Betsy is, but she's from uh, the University of Edinburgh and is here representing the Learning for Sustainable Sustainability Scotland, uh, who are part of the United Nations Regional Centre of Expertise in Education for Sustainable Development. So a real, a real expert joining us today. Thank you, Betsy. Um, and so sorry to have, have to give you such a mouthful to introduce me with, Ellie. <laughs> you asked me if I wanted more, and I said, well, you've probably got quite enough there. <laughs> you, you wear many hats, Betsy. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to take any of those away from you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak about the, the Scottish experience, I suppose, of, of COP26, but more importantly, um, after COP26, because I think... COP26 uh, was two amazing weeks, but the run up to it and most importantly, uh, the legacy of it is, is really uh, very important for us all. 
Uh, if you stay on with, with the first slide. Sorry, I don't have um, a lot of control here. <laughs> it's a bit random. Uh, not to worry. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen this COP26 logo. Um, I wanted, first of all, to say that COP26 did really en energise activity around sustainability and climate change in, in education in Scotland. So uh, there was a massive amount of really amazing activity going on in every sector in the run up to the conference. And I mean, right through from early years, you know, schools, colleges, universities, communities, youth work, uh, absolutely brilliant stuff. Um, our contribution in the main uh, was through developing two MOOCs. Uh, I don't know whether you've come across these things, massive open online uh, courses. And uh, we, with the University of Edinburgh and funded by British Council, developed one called Learning for a Sustainable Future. Uh, but most excitingly, we then ran one live at COP26. And I wanted to say this because you can still go in and sign up and see all the resources, including uh, the one and a half hours of ministerial uh, commitments, but there, there are lots of uh, real live activity uh, captured in there. So it's well worth going in and, and having a look at them. Um, all the resources are in one place. And for us, this was followed by our uh, we hosted the Global Regional Centre of Expertise Conference, and it was great actually to flow through uh, from something which was very policy or orientated and actually not very education orientated at the COP uh, to linking in with action all over the world, which is to do with education. Um, I put in this, this other uh, image that you might have seen on the right here, which was the Tree of Promises. And uh, for me, you know, that's what COP26 was all about. It was promises uh, through many sectors. And well, it's really quite exciting that this year uh, there were education promises for the first time. So how does that actually play out in action? Well, if you go on to the next slide, Anne, in Scotland, uh, for those of you that don't already know, um, education in Scotland is not the same as education in England. This is a devolved thing. Uh, so we have uh, been in Scotland uh, framing ESDGC, which I think is how sometimes it's framed in England, education for sustainable development, sustainability education, climate education, all of those in Scotland are termed learning for sustainability. Um, the SDGs underpin everything the government does. And you can see, uh, if you look into that graphic, which is the national performance framework, you can see how they, that detail plays out uh, with, and one thing I love is that kindness kind of underpins all of that and is at the, is at the center, uh, it's about values. And in Scotland, 3 to 18, uh, learning for sustainability is in policy an entitlement for all learners. It's embedded in our inspection. It's also uh, central to the professional standards for teachers. And these have been very recently strengthened. So actually uh, now every head teacher has to develop a whole school approach. It's embedded within the standards. And it's also woven through our curriculum. Um, so this sounds fantastic. And uh, I think even better is that since 2019, we have had an action plan to implement this. So we've got the policy and we're still in implementation and we always will be because this is always a journey. It's always a work in progress. And uh, so how did COP actually impact on, on this? Uh, so if you go into the next slide, Anne, um, I would say even before COP, um, the pressure from young people in Scotland, uh, like in the rest of the UK, has made a real difference. So uh, the pressure from young people, which has come through 
from Fridays for the Future in, in particular um, and Teach the Future has been important in the context of COP26. It meant that our ministers actually talked to young people uh, a lot more than anybody else. And uh, that, that has made a difference. Um, also, there were processes which were to do with democratic engagement uh, and young people, but also to do with uh, all people. So we had a climate assembly. And uh, these things are really what's behind our ministers saying at the COP that uh, climate education, well, actually she meant learning for sustainability and she said learning for sustainability is actually going to go through beyond three to 18. And uh, the asks that were made by the climate assembly and uh, by the Scottish Youth Climate Declaration and the Scottish Youth Parliament, these are asks that went to government and they have to be acted on. Uh, so that is a big thing. Uh, so this was happening already, but I think it has been something that has energized. Um, another great thing that happened in the run up was that we usually have Scottish Education Awards, but this year the Scottish Education Awards were all uh, learning for sustainability awards. And we had a lot of different categories under that, that ran through from community learning uh, to you know, uh, estates, right through everything. And that, that was energizing. But how do we maintain this momentum? And- uh, Let's see, just a few seconds. Yeah. Oh, okay, this, yeah. right. So this is the important bit. <laughs> okay, so uh, in the- UK, the UK has signaled to Scotland that it is going to commit to the UNESCO ESG 2030. Uh, our Scottish minister uh, is saying that that is something that we possibly will sign up to, but it hasn't been signed off yet. But uh, that's an important thing. Um, how does it play out? Well, yeah, our minister wasn't was on the panel at that joint ministerial summit. Uh, she wasn't wasn't speaking, uh, but she was on the panel. Um, and our ministers have been speaking, uh, or our officials rather, have speak, spoken to the UK about, uh, or DFE rather about the initiatives that are UK wide. And the, the two that are UK wide are this education nature park and the leadership awards. It's not really clear what resources are gonna be coming for that though. So uh, that will be important. And I think resources are a big question mark generally, uh, even in Scotland uh, where there is a ministerial commitment the opportunities though are there in Scotland because uh, we have undergone an, an OECD review of the curriculum in Scotland and there's been a consultation on education reform uh, and there's an opportunity for LFS to really be underpinning the purpose of education in a more explicit way through that. Um, I would say more in, sorry. Thanks, Betsy. Is it, close? Yeah, if, can you post in the chat, perhaps in terms of contact? I'm just really conscious of time. Sorry, so can you to... just remind me what the last two points were? Again, if you just go back. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say was that there's a commitment to refresh the LFS action plan in the contest text, particularly of young people's. Uh, what young people are, are wanting. Uh, so apologies for taking more than seven minutes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you so much, Betsy. And just thank you to Kirsten as well, who's been backing you up by putting everything in the chat for us to link us to all of those key documents and telling us where to go next. Thank you so much, Betsy. My, my brilliant colleague, Kirsten. <laughs> thank you, Kirsten. Okay, I'm going to, yeah, and, and, and thanks, and a lovely tangible example of from pledge to policy to practice, but not without caveats um, there as well. So I'm going to pass the baton now on to Will, if we can, yeah, there he is. 
So will a year 12 student uh, representing the Midlands and UK Schools Sustainability Network and participated in COP26 and will, if you want to share anything else about yourself, um, yeah, uh, please do, but I'm going to hand over to you for your perspective. Thank you. So um, I, alongside with uh, quite a lot of other young people from the UK Schools Sustainability Network, we went to COP um, to engage in some of the um, kind of education uh, negotiations and also to run a stand in the green zone where we were talking about the need for better uh, climate education that is accessible to all young people and also to talk about climate anxiety and the impact that has on young people and so we were really pleased um, to see some of the steps that um, have been taken and in particular the draft education strategy but we still think there's a really long way to go in terms of making education that is fit um, for young people and that satisfies the needs of our society forward. So it, in, in that report, it is clear that the government is trying to commit and trying to pledge to ensure that young people have access to education and have the resources available uh, and teachers have the resources available to teach them about the importance of sustainability and the difficulty of climate change but we still think that that doesn't go far enough. And so one of the things we are really trying to advocate for is compulsory climate education. Uh, given how grave the situation is, given how much we stand to lose, it, we think it is crucial that every single young person who passes through an education system has a well-rounded view of what climate change is and what we stand to lose as um, an impact of it. Um, we believe very strongly that um, by educating young people, we can have a trickle down effect and have more and more people in society at large understand the importance of um, climate change and understand how significant a problem it is. Because as young people learn more things, they, they start to pass that on to their parents. And rather than trying to target the furthest away groups, the people who don't really care if we start to target young people who are in a position to listen uh, and are in a position to um, take action themselves, we can slowly um, start to kind of trickle out and get more and more people acting on climate change and changing their behaviour. Um, we, um, I think Anna Romero talked about, um, or possibly, I can't remember who, but talked about um, Finland. Um, and Finland has been really big on... Um, climate change strategy, as has um, Spain and uh, Italy more recently. Um, and I think those countries are making um, climate change part of their core curriculum and it, they are making it essentially compulsory for everyone. We're still not doing that in the UK and you still don't have to learn about climate change. It is very reliant on what school you go to and what subjects you choose to study. You don't, not everyone has the same level of understanding of the problem. Uh, whereas for something like RS or sex education, everyone has to be taught it. Um, I think it is very, very important moving forward, therefore, that we have a strategy that not only um, ensures that everyone is educated, but ensures that everyone is empowered. We as young people are, it is clear, there were lots of surveys done before COP, more than half of young people experience some form of climate anxiety. There is an immense sense of pretty much dread about what is happening and so we need an education system that not only educates but also um, acknowledges um, what we face we need to be empowered to take action ourselves um, obviously educational neutrality is a big limiting factor in how much teachers can help us in empowering us and helping us take action but young people need to fully understand an issue. They need to understand the importance of taking personal action and be empowered to take personal action. They also need to be empowered by the education they receive to stand up for, for the climate, to stand up against the government in some cases and against corporations who act irresponsibly. And so we need to build an education system um, that essentially allows young people to question and allows young people to challenge and gives them the knowledge they need uh, to, to make those challenges while also ensuring that they 
that they are part of a bigger conversation. And obviously we have to do that within the bounds of neutrality, but we are capable of that. Um, for instance, in, in Sweden, uh, where climate change education is being sustainable and an acknowledgement of the importance of nature has been a core part of the curriculum for uh, well over a decade, um, there, there's been a, a kind of a, a cultural change of more kind of acknowledgement um, and more, um, I guess you could say, a change in behaviour of the people at large. And we, if you create a society where the people are educated into action and the people are educated into fully understanding an issue, you will start to see results and you will start to see lower emissions uh, and less kind of... Um, kind of blatant um disposable like getting rid of stuff much more uh, much higher recycling rates um and in italy again with even the um compulsory climate education was only introduced in 2019 but cultural changes and polls have shown that not only young people but society at large attitudes are starting to shift and so as an englishman i'm quite jealous of what's happening in scotland because their strategy is much better than um the strategy we have for the UK at large but while the draft education strategy and the pledges the UK government have made are really good to see and they are a step in the right direction they do seem to still be only a very small step and we must make sure that we build an education system that not only empowers young people but um, gives them the knowledge they need to not just take action on a personal level but take action on a massive level because this is this is the fight of young people. We are the ones who are going to have to face the consequences. And so uh, certainly the UK SSN and I believe that every young person should be taught about climate change and how devastating it will be. And every young person should be climate literate and be empowered to take action on every level. Thank you so much, Will. Um, beautifully said. And um, you know, um, I don't know about anyone else, but I feel your worry too. Um, and I think it's so good to make the points about not just giving people knowledge, but empowering. And yes, we are all jealous of Scotland. Um, but, you know, there are still, you know, uh, young people in Scotland who are, are upset. And they're also, you know, campaigning as well. So it's not perfect yet. And I think, as you said, it is a cultural change that we're looking for. Um, and, and education could be part of that. Um, so um, thank you for those three um, uh, inputs. You've heard about the video and the pledges. Uh, and if you've got any comments or questions, please write them in the chat. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and um, ask one of the questions. I saw a great one from, if I'm sharing this, I can't see the chat, but I think I saw a great um, one from- um, Sorry to be the voice of, um, we might, might just need to be careful about time, perhaps okay. it's the uh, year 1738 now, so. Okay, there's one great question. I don't, I'm not, don't think we're gonna answer it, but maybe you can answer it in your groups. Um, so from Paul Anderson asked, said that the, clim, uh, the, the curriculum in the UK is still very racist. So how do we change um, not just the curriculum, but the way education runs, so that it's no longer racist and people of colour are included in these things, um, uh, in what we're taught and, and how, um, uh, how all of this is going to go. I think it was a great question, Paul, and hopefully you can answer that in your um, groups or think about it. Because what we're going to ask you now to do is to go into breakout groups, um, and uh, there'll be quite a few of you in each group. There'll be a facilitator in each group, um, and just asking you, now, um, what would you prioritise in a pledge? Having heard all of that just now, um, what would you prioritise in a pledge? And that's just a discussion. Uh, you can write it in chat if you want to, um, or if someone wants to be a facilitator and, and write it all down, that's great. Send it to us later. Uh, it's all going to be grist for the mill. So we're now asking everyone to think about um, a pledge that they would do. Um, personal and institutional, uh, rather than what we could all do together, or if you were an environment minister or an education minister, what would you do? So what we're going to ask you to do is write it into the chat, and then we're going to try and catch this on Padlet with um, Ellis leading that. Now, these are ideas. Don't worry. Um, you, no one's going to insist you keep them. Um, we're not going to come around as the pledge police uh, and make sure you do it, but... 
just to get some ideas of what what could we or institutionally be pledging uh, to ensure that 4.7 and climate education and uh, all of this gets embedded in the right of every every learner in every situation. So we've got one about the purpose of education. Uh, that needs to change. Um, and another one is about um, understanding what impact we're trying to have. Um, those aren't pledges, but they're sort of questions. Um, Swadika says we need an action plan and pledge a net zero for 2030. The government hasn't done 2030, so that's a good one. Uh, Rosamond, lovely. Thanks very much, Rosamond. Uh, we need to go beyond pledges and actions, easy to replicate, do and cause a tsunami of change. I love that. So actually, so uh, her pledge is to go beyond pledges and actions for a tsunami of change. There was some questions about the Youth Climate Leaders Award that people were worried about that one. Inhib inhibiting meaningful activism or protest. But more closely with our local communities and businesses. Foster the art of storytelling. Uh, one from um, my group was to kind of work more holistically. Uh, so make the connections between the different groups, students, educators, policy makers, the community, but also work more holistically in terms of the topics and issues. So the ecological, but also the social justice, the history. So not, not to let these go into silos. There's another one there about culture change as well. Um, lifelong learning habits. Yep, yeah, that would be a great one. Evolve parents from day one. Um, this is from my group, Pledge to Review Messaging and Processes to see if they're inclusive, inclusive of people of colour and youth, because um, there have been um, people who've said that actually, you know, we're, we're in our own little bubble and we don't always think about what it sounds like or is it inclusive enough of other people? There's loads. <laughs> okay, well, I think what we should do is commit our own pledge here uh, to put this onto the Our Shared World website as a, as a collection of pledges. Julie, I know that you're with us. I have spotted you and I know you were going to prepare some lovely, lovely words to perhaps close our session today. Might you um, pop your microphone on and join us for our final words? Yeah, thank you. I thought we'd run out of time, but I'm thank really you, glad. Julie. I'm really glad I've got the opportunity to do this. So um, I've been inspired by a wonderful initiative called Letters to the Earth, which also has a really fantastic um, teaching, downloadable teaching resource. And I've not yet written my letter to the earth and I decided to write it specially for this occasion. So um, here we go. Dear earth, you always were the best teacher, the repository of ancient knowledge, the sage with a key to the future, the librarian of living things, the mistress of the micro and the macro, I apologize unreservedly for all those who sat at the back of the class and did not listen to your wise words, for all those who forgot pen and paper and failed to do their homework, for the lazy and the arrogant, for those who feigned sickness and did not notice you were ailing. We are all sick now. Indeed, we are found wanting. There is a gaping hole in the ozone layer Coral reefs are devoid of life. Some rivers run dry, whilst others break their banks and flood. Parched forests burn. Animals and insects perish. Species die out. Black oil spills. Tubs full of coal still rattle to the staves, waiting to be shipped across oceans awash with pollution. The temperature is rising. And all the while, governments prevaricate adding to the hot air with empty promises and pledges not worth writing in the shifting sand. The circular economy is not a playground game. Fossil fuel free is not just an exercise in alliteration. Tipping point is not an after-school club. 
climate science is for everybody, not just for PhD students. Climate anxiety is a real thing. The SDGs are agreed targets and not unmentionable diseases. Pay attention, classmates. Climate catastrophe waits around the corner like a school bully bent on destroying those who mocked and belittled, those who turn their backs on the brewing storms that have overtaken all of us. So let's get back to basics. Isn't that what the government wants? We need a new curriculum of kindness and care that places you, dear Earth, our teacher, at the centre. We need to see things in the round, a bird's eye view, the perspective from the seabed, and a focus on the polar opposites. We need to know where we are from and remember that everyone is from somewhere else. They too want a brighter future. The first lesson must therefore be the importance of we, not I. For in our shared world, there will be no losers, no hunger, no war. We will learn real maths, share resources fairly. Arts and science will be of equal value. History will teach us not to make the same mistakes again. Geography will join up the dots between people and places, animal, vegetable, and mineral. Technology will bring us closer together, not tear us apart through hate and division. Citizenship will teach us global stewardship. We will learn the language of compassion. We will be lifelong learners, not shirkers of collective responsibility. We will sit at your feet, dear Earth, and this time we will pay attention.